up everyone it's been a while so i was called out to a shop to look at a 2005 uh, 2005 dodge ram that had a parasitic draw um so i filmed some of this on site as i was editing this video i realized i didn't do a good job explaining as much as i should have so i'm gonna have these edits throughout uh, throughout the video so hope you enjoy here working on a 2005 Dodge Durango. Finding a parasitic draw, I have about a 900 milliamp parasitic draw, almost an amp, right? So it's astronomically high. <clears throat> now, so you just seen me test for a parasitic draw and in order to test for a parasitic draw, you're gonna usually disconnect one of the battery cables and put your um, multimeter, your DVOM, in series right so the current is going to be flowing through your um, DVOM to measure the amperage now you can use an amp clamp but in my experience with lower amperage uh, draws they're not as accurate uh, but in order to set up for a parasitic draw test you're going to disconnect the battery put your meter in series uh, before you do that though before you do that you want to open up your car doors you want to uh, press all the door jar switches so that the vehicle thinks that the doors are closed uh, Hood switch if you have that You're gonna want all of these things uh, To make the vehicle think that the car should be asleep uh, When in fact it's wide open so that you can get in and out and test some things right now. I have this up here because uh, Dodge actually gives us a parasitic draw spec and for a 2005 Dodge Ram, they said you should have between 5 and 35 milliamps of current draw. Now, my rule of thumb is anything below 50 milliamps on most makes and models. Uh, but we need to be below 35 milliamps uh, to be within spec with the Dodge Ram. Now, you just seen I had 920 milliamps, almost a full amp of parasitic draw. So I am well above where I should be. And this here is with the car. The car should have been asleep at this point. Uh, that's another thing I should add as well. When you do these tests, depending on the make and model, a 2005 doesn't take very long to go to sleep. But some of these newer cars can take up to an hour. So you gotta set these cars up and just walk away. You can't sit there and stare at them because that hour feels like eternity. Set them up and walk away. It just so happened that this car only took a few minutes to fall asleep or should say should have fallen asleep but I uh, just wanted to make that clear how you set up a multimeter and what your spec should have been out here at another shop full disclosure I already had this diagnosed uh, before before I started filming this um, but I figured it was pretty cool I wanted to show you all what I had found now with the key out of the ignition, I did a uh, health check because this radio, uh, this radio was staying on. Now that doesn't necessarily mean anything was wrong with it. Well, it actually is. This radio stays on, but the customer is aware that that's not the draw he's concerned about. But There's a couple things I wanted to cover before uh, going any farther. There's a couple different CAN networks on this vehicle. CAN bus B is for all of the body modules, so everything inside of the vehicle that controls some of the body functions is CAN bus B. CAN bus C is a lot of the things uh, for, say, transmission, uh, engine, that's all CAN bus C. Now, all of those modules get turned on and off with the ignition switch. So as you turn the ignition switch on and off, that is providing a signal to the CAN bus C network for the modules to stay awake or not. Now, it's important to know that CAN bus B is not the same. CAN bus B bus network remains active until all nodes, which is a fancy word for modules, until all nodes on the network are ready to sleep. Uh, this is determined by the network using tokens in a manner similar to pooling, they say. So when the last node that is active on the network is ready for sleep, and it has already received the token indicating that all of the other nodes on the bus are ready for sleep, it broadcasts a bus sleep acknowledgement message that causes the network to go to sleep. This was all in service information. Now once CAN bus B is asleep, any node on the bus can be awoken by 
another module transmitting a message on the network. So this here is important to understand because this here is um, a wiring diagram for a module that has CAN bus B on it. So we have the electronic overhead module shown and you have a fused battery positive hot at all times. You have a ground, you have a couple sensors, right? Uh, but you have CAN bus B. What you don't have is an ignition input to this. So uh, understand that these modules on CAN bus B are put to sleep and awoken by CAN messages. But I had, I had some codes that I was looking at and it looks like CAN bus B was stored on. So I disconnected this radio and I back probed CAN bus B. And you can see I'm getting CAN bus even with the key in my hand. Now, at that point I looked at all the data lines and looked at everything that was on CAN bus B and I started disconnecting things. Uh, I, I went for the easiest stuff first. So the occupant detection sensor, it's underneath the seat. I disconnected first. Uh, radio, I did second because of this issue. Uh, but every time I disconnected the occupant sensor or the radio, I still had this waveform. So then I came up to this overhead console and I disconnected this. Now I'm gonna have to set you all down. As soon as I disconnect this, if you wait about, uh, I don't know, five to 10 seconds, boom, just like that, CAN bus goes to sleep. I can no longer, if I go back and I do a code scan, I don't detect any modules anymore. Look, this is April 19th. I don't know if y'all can see, it's, it's snowing here, April 19th. So no modules are detected. Um, yeah, no systems detected now. I'm gonna disconnect this because this here draws amperage. I'm gonna go check that battery draw with that disconnected. Clean off the snow off my meter. Looking at about 12 milliamps of current now. So this thing's good. Just needs that overhead console replaced. Now, a couple other things that I, I maybe forgot to mention in this video was, number one, what made me do the CAN bus check? Um, I pulled the fuse for the radio. Um, that fuse also powered a couple other things and the draw went away. But as I was looking at this wiring diagram, I realized that it did not have an ignition feed. It was part of the CAN network that should have put the radio to sleep. Now, when I originally got there, I wasn't aware that this radio uh, was a known issue by the customer and as the customer would shut their vehicle off they'd also shut the radio off um, the reason that the radio was staying on is because they connected the ignition feed this here's an aftermarket radio so it has an ignition feed and it has a hot at all times feed they wired them together to keep the radio on because they this radio would not take a can input I'm sure there's an adapter, but it wasn't wired in. So it did not have the CAN input to turn on and shut off the radio. I was not aware that this was a known issue when I got to this shop with the radio. So when I looked at this wiring diagram and I seen that it was put to sleep using the CAN network, that's when I decided to do the uh, all system scan just to see if the network was still awake or not. So I guess I got lucky by doing the CAN network scan before testing all of the fuses all at once, but I guess it's better to be lucky than good, right? Now, now one of the things I noticed uh, once I pulled that overhead console down was there was water stains on the plastic. So there was water coming in from the sunroof and I had talked to the shop owner afterwards and he had recently replaced the fuse box because of corrosion in a fuse box from water coming in from the sunroof. So. Pretty sure this overhead console went bad just because of water damage, but I hope you all learned something. I hope you all enjoyed this, um, and uh, I'll catch you all next time.